Okay, well, welcome everyone to um, our first um, collapse time together. Um, this is usually uh, life group nights where we're doing the discipleship, praying with each other, growing in the gifts of the Spirit, etc., etc. I just want to say, um, we don't normally talk about life groups, particularly when we meet together, but it's been so good just hearing the stories of answered prayer. Uh, prophetic moments, just real deep conversations that have started to see people really grow in their identity. That's what community is about, you know. And so um, I just want to say for those of you who are plugged into Life Group, um, that you will probably be able to encourage those around you who aren't a part of Life Groups to really get engaged because that is actually where uh, people are flourishing. Sundays are great, the community is great on a Sunday. Uh, but it's in the nitty gritty of doing life with each other that we actually are able to kind of thrash some of that stuff out, you know. Um, and if anyone knows if you've ever been married, they say marriage is the best thing for knocking the edges off. Life group is the second best to that. Okay, so uh, if you're not part of life groups, life groups will be reconvening again collectively in September. We're going to be launching a prophetic academy where we train the church in hearing the voice of God, how to discern what God is saying, how we uh, to know what to do with that word, and then also learning the various ways that God speaks to us. So we're in a house where we've seen the prophetic move, word of knowledge, dream interpretation, visions, dreams, and all that stuff. I really want to impart that to you, that we unlock that. Uh, and it's with what we're going to discuss tonight in mind of that. And I'm just aware that there are many new people here today um, who have walked into this building in maybe the last couple of months. And um, sometimes we're not really aware of the history of where people come from. So tonight what I want to do is I want to just really make clear who we are as Presence Church. What is the culture and the values, the foundations of who we are to remind us or to kind of give clarity for the first time for people? I want us to have a look at where we've come from. You know, our history with God is really important. It actually has keys in that that um, enable us to be able to then go from strength to strength, faith to faith, glory to glory. And I believe that God has only just begun doing what he desires to do through a presence people. Uh, and I'm really excited because this building is amazing and this is a miracle that we're sat in. You know, this is going to be a house of miracles. This is going to be a movement of people where the miraculous is the everyday. And what is the miraculous? It's his world invading ours. That's all it is. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so I just want to just uh, cover a little bit about who we are then as Presence Church uh, Lauren and I, Lauren, stand up for the people. There you go. Wow, she gets a clap. I just got, <laughs> I got a dull roar. That's what I got in the background. Uh, myself and Lauren, during the time of lockdown, we uh, met to, uh, just before lockdown. Um, Lauren was told by God that the next person you meet, you're going to marry. I was bounding along to our first date, unbeknown to me that eternity had already decided my fate like a lamb to the slaughter, uh, and actually it was um, a, an answer to prayer of heart's desire because I always desired to get married um, where there was kingdom purpose at the root of it. That's what our marriages are for as well, you know, and um, during that time of lockdown, we started to feel like God wanted to do something new in the city, and the phrase, put the chair in the air if you just don't care, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were about to start some kind of brawl. Uh, don't you worry. We're, we're a house of healing. Um, so um, this is what we felt. We felt like God wanted to do something new. We're really thankful for what God has done in the city in previous generations and what he does today in the various churches. But very clearly, uh, Lauren and I felt like God had called us to prepare a house for his glory that people would be able to come and encounter him. And it was um, the language of revival had been marked for this city. If you know anything about Stoke-on-Trent, it has such a rich 
history of revival where thousands of people came into a revelation of who Jesus Christ was. The power of the Holy Spirit flowed. And you can't walk around the corner in Stoke-on-Trent without seeing a Methodist church. Just one monument of a past move of God that had happened in a previous generation. And we believe that God doesn't intend for moments of revival to end with one generation, but they are meant to set up the next generation that they can continue in the revelation of what it is to be a kingdom people. And usually what happens with revival is that one generation, they're breaking through. They then hinder the next generation to go further because they make a method out of it. They, they want to structure it. And we really are uh, a people who desire to not only uncap the wells of what God has already done in this city, but for the old to be added with the new. Do you remember when Jesus said about the scribes that they would take the old out of the storehouse and they will mix it with the new? I believe God wants to do something that this city has never seen before. We're living in a generation that has never seen an awakening of God's presence. They've never encountered his glory where they are literally transformed from one degree of glory because they've beheld him. And I believe that God is positioning us on the precipice of a move of God that is unprecedented. I genuinely believe that. And it's moved us to step out to see God create a space for his glory. And wasn't Sunday just glorious? Yeah. It, was, it was a new depth that we'd gone as presence, church. But I want to tell you, church, we have only just dipped a toenail in what God has for this house. Uh, this house is going to be a place of abiding glory that when that coffee shop is open in the week, people get healed just by being in the atmosphere. Okay, we've seen nothing yet. Yeah, we're seeing healing and wonderful miracles in the hospitals and in the church. We're laying on our hands. How about just there's an abiding glory that the atmosphere of heaven just invades in possible situations? I believe that's where we're headed in this city again. And so that was a part of what God had called us to do. You know, uh, the name and fame of Jesus really is the desire of our heart. Everything that we do is with Jesus in mind that he receives the fullness of his reward. Because 2,000 years ago, he said that it was finished and he died for all those in the past, those in the present and all those to come in the future. His sacrifice is so eternal in nature that he is still reaping the rewards of his sacrifice. For me, that is absolutely incredible. And so Presence Church is an expression that would be able to see the name and fame of Jesus exalt and expand across a region and a nation. And that is the sole purpose of it. You can take the branding, take Presence Church away, get rid of the name, delete the logo, etc. We would still have a heart that beats for Jesus that he would receive all of his glory. And isn't that why we come to be a part of the church? And I think we're all experiencing an awakening, a revival personally to some degree because we keep coming back you know our church services are long you know people are used to 20 minutes of worship a nice 30 minute word where there's three points an illustration and an application and you have your cup of tea and you go home but actually we are so hungry for the presence of God that some of my most incredible moments is when people are staying and worshiping for 45 minutes an hour after the church service just because there's a a wave of glory that just sweeps over. It's all for Jesus. And if we are not representing Jesus to a city, then this is just a community club. But actually his kingdom is to break out of us. That's what Presence Church is about. And we do that through three main areas, through worship. Worship, you can tell, is our priority. Uh, we will hijack a sermon every day of the week if worship takes off. Because why do you need to speak about the person when he's there in the room in the midst of us? You know, and we are so excited to see God doing some incredible things. Relationships are being restored. Bodies are being healed without people praying, but in the atmosphere of worship, that as we praise him, he comes in and inhabits the praises of his people. People suddenly start having an encounter, an experience with Jesus, not just having a head knowledge of him. And that is what it means for the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, a contact experience with Jesus. And then we believe in equip him. You know, we... Uh, try to tailor our messages to equipping your heart and your mind to expect what God is revealing to us. You know, and uh, the, the Prophetic Academy and the Evangelism Academy that Adam, uh, Adam, um, Anthony uh, did only a couple of months ago was all very specific in trying to give tools to the church so that the church can go and do the work of ministry. You know, the man of God thing is dead. 
We know that, right? The man of God isn't the person that we look to to do all this stuff and we all get behind him and celebrate, but true biblical leadership is that the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they equip the saints for work of ministry. So guess who should be seeing more miracles? It should be the body, not the leaders, because their job is to equip and to release you to go into mighty exploits. And that's part of what revival is. We believe that revival is an individual experience. You become awakened to the presence of God in you, continually going deep in your revelation and intimacy with Jesus. We believe that revival is something that happens as a community, and we experienced that on Sunday. I believe Sunday Gone was one of those revival moments that awakened us to something new. But revival is also regional, where a city is able to come to drink from a well of his goodness, that those who are thirsty come to him and have a drink and they'll never thirst again. That he releases that life and life abundantly. And, you know, where is a well most needed? Where it's dry, you know? And we're living in a city that is desperately dry, but I believe God's allowed it to get dry so that it can actually just receive what God really wants to give it. And that's a part of who we are. And so we have four main... Um, is that your head or is that... Can you just move that bottle for me, Lar? Sorry. Yeah, you can tap it for me. That will teach me for nicking this from work. Where's the just press it? down. You're doing great. Yeah, well, I, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. Just, call, just press escape and then do it again. For some reason it's frozen. No. There we go. There, there we are. Four main foundation stones. So everything about Presence Church is to flow out of one of these foundation stones. And each foundation stone flows into the next. So we've already talked about worship. Everything that we do, our whole lifestyles are governed to giving God worship. That's not just us singing uh, Christian songs uh, in a community, but it's in every expression of our life. It's in how we interact with each other in relationships. It's in how we offer our gifts to the service of the Lord. It's in how we use our financial resources, our energy and our time. They are all expressions of worship that create space to give glory to God. And we generally believe that that is our primary call, is to be a worshipping people. You know, I heard a phrase a long time ago that a lot of the people look to God at his hand rather than look into his face. You know, what can they get from God rather than what they can bring? And we really felt that God wanted to create a house where people didn't look to be served, but they came to serve. They came to pour out. So it's my expectation that you come to the house of God with a prophetic word. You come with a psalm. You come with a song because that's what 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, that each of us comes to the house of God in their expression of worship, ready to edify and build up one another. So it shouldn't be that it's just the front pouring out over the masses, but we should be able to have a word for the person to the left and the right of us, and that's an expression of worship that we have. And it's as we create an, an environment of worship that we're able to then step into a place of encounter. I believe our worship experiences are incomplete if we haven't met him. You know, we don't do Christian karaoke here. We don't just put some words up and sing along together and have a great time, but we believe that those words are powerful. So if there's a new song that comes up on the screen and I don't know it, you won't find me singing it. I will go through it first to make sure that I understand what I'm singing because what I want to come out of my mouth needs to flow from the depths of my heart. That's worship. We don't go through the motions. We want an encounter with the living God. And we know that when we gather with him, two or three of us in his name, there he is present. So I actually see Jesus in front of me and I offer him, I'm literally giving him something. And that's the heart of everything that we do. When I'm ministering the word, uh, yes, I'm ministering to you, but I'm so aware that he is watching and he's listening and even weighing up the motives of why I do what I do, that even that becomes an expression of worship as well. And I believe that that's to be an example for all of us. That everything that we do, from those on the car park, those on the front door, the coffee shop, the people in the week cleaning the toilets, that we never think of those people. They are expressing a heart of worship that says, God, I want to pour into your house. And so that should lead into this encounter where we're truly changed, truly transformed. It's individual, like I said. It's us as a community. 
and it's us as a region. Now, when we become awakened to God, we suddenly want to start doing things for the Lord. You know, we aren't saved by works, but we are certainly saved for good works. You've been created for good works before the foundation of the world. And so we really believe in raising a royal priesthood. And that is to give you the tools through training, equipping, the preaching of the word that we can put a sword in the hand of warriors so that they can then go and do the fourth foundation stone, which is kingdom mission. You know, the righteous are as bold as lions and they'll do mighty exploits, those who know God. And we believe that every single one of you sat in this room and those who are part of us who aren't here, who are going to be watching, that God has buried kingdom callings on the inside of you that just need to be partnered with, just need to be equipped. And you have the permission to go and extend the kingdom of God in the city or in the nation or the nations. And so that is the house that we are. We come together, we encounter the Lord, we train and equip, and we expect to see you go out. That's what apostolic means. It means to send out. We expect you to be doing mighty exploits with God. And if you're still here two, three years time, and you still haven't found what it is that you've been called to do, and you haven't been able to align to be equipped and then to go, then something is missing. And we need to have a look at how can we awaken you to the call of God upon your life. And that's why we're here. We see ourselves as a platform for you guys to be able to flourish and thrive. Lauren, next one. So the journey so far then, I just want to remind you, you're going to have to stay there and press some buttons for us, Lauren. Thank you, <laughs> lovely, lovely helper. Um, the journey so far, like I said, myself and Lauren... Um, we had this dream to prepare a house for God's glory and somehow we managed to convince three other people. One of them was my mother-in-law and then the others was Josh and Julia who were there from inception stage and we just started to meet in our house. Uh, and I think the second time we met, we had seven and I think uh, you were there with Stu and they didn't even live in the city at the time. So that was what we started off with, a very small seed that just responded to a sense of calling we didn't really see where it was going to go, but we knew that we had that call and we had these foundation stones. And so we started to journey together. And so we started, do you want to press the next one, Lauren? We started with presence nights, just nights of worship. As you can see, um, it looks really busy there, but that's because we invited a load of guests who were a part of another church, just so it looked good on the photograph. <laughs> and it, to be fair, it was a great night. You know, people got healed. Uh, people got filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, our boys uh, left that meeting practicing slaying each other in the spirit because they saw people going down on the floor. You know, they're in the lift and they started to watch Benny Hinn videos, you know, throwing their coat at each other. Something came alive even in our own children right at that very first meeting. And so we then, yeah, you can press again and again. So we then started to invite people to come. Go back up, Lauren. And again. And then back down. Just wait for it to load. On this? No, go on the white screen for me. Don't know why the clicker's not working. Wait for it to click up. <laughs> it's like waiting for England to win something, isn't it? So close yet so far. Just click it again. It might not be on there. No. Okay, yeah, just go past it. That's fine. So uh, that's what our church looked like. That was a normal Sunday when we decided to go weekly. Um, sometimes there was five people, sometimes there was ten people. Uh, every now and then there would be an influx of 15 people and we thought we had revival in the city. Then we would then go back down to six people. And This is what I felt the Lord say to us when we first started. Um, always do everything for the audience of one. And I remember somebody coming into the church saying when we were setting up all the text and putting the awful lights at the front uh, where we thought we were doing a good job. They said, do you not think this is overkill with the amount of numbers of people that we've got? And I just remember saying to him, I never did it for you, I did it for him. Because that was the best that we had to offer. Um, and so uh, there was a time, would you keep clicking, Lauren, for us? There was a time when we went from that... Uh, that we then uh, invited a barbecue. Who remembers the barbecue and came to the barbecue? Jeff, who's now one of our core leaders, I met him at that barbecue. And you might think we're insane, but we just put an invitation out to people who we knew and didn't know, turn up to our house. We were lucky we had any sofas left. 
You know, we had 30, 40 people turn up for a barbecue. It rained up until about three minutes before that barbecue. Um, and we just hosted people and just connected with people. And I think that was a real turning point for us where it felt like we were even so in our own home to see God build a home in the city. Um, and so we then ended up with what looks like revival to us. So we've gone from <laughs> five to seven people and the numbers start coming. Uh, as you notice, we start to see children come in. Uh, we had the children pray for people. We had children giving words. Uh, anyone who was there who remembered, um, what's his name, Lauren? Joseph. Sorry? Joseph. No, 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 the little boy gives a Bible reading. Jacob. Jacob. He was, I think he's six years old at the time, came and read scripture at the front of church, closed it, sat down, and everyone was just like, glory to God. As I worship just went through the roof, because it's through children that we recognized that God was doing something new. Thanks, Lauren. And then we started to pioneer Presence Kids started then about a year ago. So in fact, we're only a week away from Presence Kids being a year old. In a tiny little room in the YMCA, it was absolute mayhem. It really was. But we were just faithful with the little that God gave us. And any of you who are here who have dreams with God for what you're about to do in the next season, never despise the day of small That's beginnings. Right. Because if we're faithful with little, he gives us much. Thanks, Lauren. Keep going. Uh, I mean, look, more people start coming. This is the, the, the heart of the house. Right from the very start, we have people laying hands on each other, activating the gifts so that people could really flourish. And we started to see this community of people start to uh, raise up where they had an expectancy that God could heal through them or God could have a word of knowledge through them or God could minister the life of the kingdom through them. And the word of mouth started to come out and other people started to come in. Thanks, Lauren. We suddenly stopped to get to this point. Now, I remember when we got to this point, uh, I suddenly started to feel the pressure of people. Like, oh, well, they kind of come because they've heard of word of knowledge, heard of healing. And I started to feel, I remember the Holy Spirit saying, who are you doing it for? You know, we did it with the little, the least, with the five. We did it for the one. And there's another type of test when fruitfulness comes. How many of you know that actually right through the Old Testament, Israel was most vulnerable in their seasons of prosperity? Why? Because complacency sets in. You take your eyes off the one who brought the fruitfulness in the first place. And I remember it was in that Sunday um, that the Lord said, remember you're doing it for the one. And it freed me to the point where I could just be with the Lord. And it was an amazing time that night. Uh, and we just continued just to see us filled to the point where that room had a capacity of 60. And we hit the point where we were consistently about 40 people. Now, is at that point, thanks, Lauren. It was at that point where we were starting to think we might need to move building. And uh, we were at this point, 5 p.m. on a Sunday evening, regularly 30 to 40 people maybe starting to come. And um, I said to the guys, um, don't go on right move. Don't go on the internet searching for buildings because it's the most stressful thing. Any of you who've been looking for a house to buy, you know, like, is it this one? Is it that one? And we just said, God will bring us a building. And it's one of those statements that comes out of your mouth that sounds full of faith. But really, if you were to hold me to it in the moment, I'd be like, what have we just said? But, you know, come the end of November, Trevor Baker came uh, and he released a word saying, God has a house for you, but he's been waiting to make sure that you have the right heart and the right purpose. He said, don't become a silo, become a depot. In other words, don't just gather, don't just hold on, be a people who send out, who sow people, sow ministries out into the city and God will bring other people in. A week later, um, a guy drives onto the car park um, in this really nice Mercedes and he says, I don't know why I'm here, but I feel like I need to give church a building. Uh, we didn't know what that was going to look like. He was worried about money. He said, I'm not sure you're going to be able to afford it because he saw the setup that we had that was very basic. And we said, if it's the right building, God will have the money for us. And so we went on. Hopefully this will play for us. Is it going to play? Just, just use the arrows, Lauren. There we go. This is what we announced to the church on the last Sunday before... Christmas. The internet's been the bane of our life at this point. <laughs> we do actually have our own internet line getting dug in in September, by the way, so you'll all be able to on your Wi-Fi. So 
<clears throat> Let's just give it a few seconds and then we can just have a watch. It's all right, it'll go. Where's the intercessors? <laughs> They're praying. <laughs> Trying to pause it and then. Oh, that'll do. So, this is the condition this building was in when we walked in the first time. get the idea of the condition anyway. Um, maybe I just need to try and talk, it plays. <laughs> So that was the video that we played. Yeah, you can stay on there. And uh, do you remember the shout and the roar that went up in the room when we announced that God had given us a building? It was, I actually saw this again last night. It's the first time I've seen it in about five months. I just started to tear up again, just at the goodness of God. And I, I remember just thinking, how are we going to have the money? This is a huge project that we're going to take on our hands. We were actually told by workmen that professional workmen wouldn't take on the project. Yeah, God had given us this building, a, a notorious building, a building that was a nightclub. It then became uh, a nightclub for alternate lifestyles as well. But this is what we noticed. Everybody who came in said, oh, I've got a story about this place. I remember when this happened, or I met this person here, or I fell over those stairs over there. And it was just a place of like, just everybody had something from their youth. This is what I felt the Holy Spirit say. I'm going to turn that place from a place of story to a house of testimony. And there's an anointing on this house for the stories of God to break out. And we have seen some remarkable stories happen already. And, you know, uh, that weekend we signed a week later, I think it was two weeks before Christmas. Uh, and we know what it's like with uh, workmen, they do like the Christmas off. Uh, so we couldn't actually start the work until January. Sorry, Anthony, he's just sat in the middle. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I'm only saying that because I've got a load of people in front of me who can stop him coming to me. Um, you know, we, we, we really felt like we wanted to be in by the end of February. That was like a, that was like a, a fast accelerator. Some people were saying, you're just not going to be able to get that done. We didn't have the money. We just said yes because it felt like it was the right building. And I just shared with uh, someone saying, I think 25 grand will get us set up. And unbeknown to me, that... They're, these people hadn't been in a church during lockdown and they were still paying their tithes, but they paid it into a kitty thinking it was going to go to help build a church. Guess how much was in the account? Exactly £25,000. And so we'd signed on the Saturday. By Monday, we had £25,000. By Tuesday, we were ordering workmen to come in and start taking the sledge in. And so the real work started in uh, January and it just happened so quickly. Now, if you've ever had your house renovated, it's a very slow process and it's painful to come in every day to watch 
I was going to work. Paul Lauren here was the project manager and I was asking her a million questions every day that she had zero chance of knowing the answers to. And we got through it, didn't we, babe? You know, with a bit of Christian counselling and, and a lot of prayer. But, you know, uh, that's what was starting to happen. It was a real building site. And then towards the end of thinking, right, we're going to get in, uh, just the church pitched together and just started scraping the windows, scrubbing the floors, dusting. All these were upholstered, were brand new. Sam came in and you know we would sometimes here till 10, half 10 at night and they were just stapling fabric. The church just came together because we caught hold of something that God had given us something really precious. And so we started our first Sunday in here. Uh, yeah, that's downstairs. We started in the coffee shop because downstairs was still flooded. It still wasn't ready. And I remember just the sound of worship in this room that some people actually wanted church to stay in here because of the acoustics. It was actually in here where, um, ah, name's gone right out of my, Martin. Martin got healed from crutches at the back there. People, somebody just went over. Paul and Donna went and met. Oh, there you are, Martin. I can see you. Um, you know, they met him in the post office, invited him to come, and we had chairs right round the corner. Remember, we were only a church of 30 to 40 people. We filled this room out the first morning we went to Sundays, and we're like, okay, God, you might be doing something at this point. And uh, he came through, and I remember Paul walking, holding the crutch up all the way down. It looked like something that had come from some crusade somewhere around the world. And, you know, what we didn't know is that Martin had been in the car accident 17 years Walking on crutches, is that right, Martin? And, you know, and God just healed him. Um, I think you put the crutch in the back of your car, didn't you? Never got it out again. I remember we went for a, a men's curry. And it was like, now what? I now need to start thinking what life looks like without a crutch. And you know, we've had the privilege of seeing, that's just one story of many, of just seeing Martin just come increasingly into life and life abundantly. That guy looks completely different to how he did in February when he came. What God can do in four months is outstanding. Yeah, absolutely awesome. You know, and, and Martin's a part of the history of this house. He was the very first significant miracle that happened in here. You know, and we've started seeing, that's what we started off with. Um, and then eventually we went downstairs and uh, we started to see that fill up here, just praise and worship. And then we got to this situation here where we baptized 21 people five weeks ago. Uh, six were spontaneous baptisms. Two of them got saved that morning, jumped into the waters of baptism. When that starts to happen, you start to think, OK, God, you're doing something much bigger than we expected. And we've got to the point now where um, if everybody who is connected to Presence Church who say that this is home came at the same time, we are actually only left with uh, seated on the floor. And some people in that Sunday were sat on the floor, there were people stood in the aisles. And uh, Trevor came the week later and he just saw a room packed. He, the first time he came in November, there was about 40 of us. He comes in, there was about 160 people in the room in the space of five months. And he just says, I believe that God is you know doing something here and he says I wouldn't be surprised if there's another church in six months and just something exploded in my heart something sank in Lawrence because church planting Luke was a bit of a beast the first time round, not knowing what we were doing and uh, it set us in motion here's the thing about vision God will often only show you part remember he, he desires to do immeasurably more than anything we ever ask or imagine and I see our lives like a scroll that is unrolling you know, Psalm 40, I think, talks about the scrolls of our days that have been written in eternity. And I believe that as we're faithful with what he's revealed, he reveals more of the scroll. And so what happened on that Sunday is that our heart became awakened where suddenly a church planting vision was reawakened on the inside of us. And we thought this, we're going to come to a point where people stop coming to the house because there's not enough room for them. And I'm at work a couple of days later and the art teacher has been watching, she's a Catholic, was watching what had been going on at the church, drove to come here but saw it completely fall and drove away because she thought it was too busy. When you have that problem, you know God's doing something new. And so we're at this point now where uh, we really believe that God is uh, calling us to open a brand new Presence Church site uh, at the end of September or the first week of October. Uh, that is an amazing 
opportunity for us to see what God desires to do uh, increasingly. You know, and uh, I love uh, this building. I love uh, the community that's been developed. But here's the thing. Presence Church isn't this building. Presence Church is a movement of people who have responded to an apostolic call to go and take the gospel into a city that is dying. And like I said on Sunday, if we have a church of 2,600, people will be inviting us in. They'll be inviting our worship team in, inviting our speaker, saying, how did you do it? And saying that we've been successful, but that's only 1% of this city's population. This is a city of 260,000 people. And I believe that God wants to aggressively plant churches in this city, not for building any man's empire, but for creating jars that his oil will be able to fill them. And so I just believe the next one for us, Lauren, I believe the purpose um, has kind of landed in 2 Kings 3. Remember the story when Hezekiah is led by Ahab to go to war and they go sort of the way of the wilderness and they're running out of water and uh, the the soldiers are going to die, the animals are going to die. And what do they do? They call the prophet. Now, what did the prophet do? The prophet called for the musicians. And I believe that's just another prophetic confirmation for us that keeping a heart of worship is the foundation of everything. Every breakthrough we get as a house flows out of a place of worship. And so he says, now bring me a musician. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. This is Elisha. And he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water so that you, your cattle and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. Oh, and by the way, he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Here's the prophetic picture that I believe the Lord has brought us to Presence Church. That as we plant another site, we are only creating a ditch for God to supernaturally fill. That in the same way he has supernaturally filled the YMCA, who supernaturally draw people to this building, he is going to do the same again when we move out. And I believe that our call in this city is to create space for God to come fill. And so long as we prioritize the worship, we prioritize the encounter with the Lord where we're changed and transformed. We're equipping the saints for the work of ministry and we're aggressively sending them out, commissioning them for kingdom mission. We will see every ditch that we dig filled supernaturally with the harvest that he has set apart in this city. Isn't that amazing? So I truly believe that we get to choose where to cap out. And I believe if we continue to just keep multiplying and sending people out, God will increasingly fill the places that are made by people who go and also fill the houses uh, that are opened up in the future. And so we're in the final stages of discussing a venue. If it is this venue, it is already set up for us. It's an ex-TV studio with amazing lighting, PA system, a coffee bar already for us. There has never been an easier site to plant a church in. Okay, We've done it in the YMCA where we were in at half past two, sweeping the floor with a garden broom, sweeping up rice and crisp off the floor every single Sunday for nearly a year. You know, and so this is a real opportunity for us. And we're um, going to announce at some point where that's going to be. Um, but I want to just talk about the strategy. I want to send... 30 to 50 people away from here to go on mission. And what we want to do is we want to anoint those 30 to 50 people and commission those people to go out into another part of the city to see God do again what he's done here. See, the testimony of Jesus really is the spirit of prophecy. And we put it on Jesus. He said that on our confession of our faith that he is Lord, that he will build his church. Well, we've never read a church planting book. We've never tried to take somebody else's clever strategy. We've just made way for the present, said, Jesus, build your church and build a people that can carry on what you've already started. And so why you're here tonight is it may be that you know that you have a call of God. It may be in an area of tech. It might be in the ministry of the word. It might be praying for the sick. It might be reaching communities. It might be worship, whatever it is. I want to tell you that in this particular site and building, there's only limited space. 
And if you go, I believe the Lord promises that you will grow. And so I want to start from this point on until September, encouraging and awakening in you to detach yourself from this building, detach yourself from the physical surroundings and connect with a mission for why Presence Church is here, which is to create wells of glory that people may be able to encounter him. And I believe that as we do that and create space and we continue to multiply, this site will be filled back up to 170. The new site will fill up to 150. And then guess what we're going to do? We're going to take a 50 from that site, plant a church, take another 50 from this one, send them out into the city and plant another church. Why? Not so that we can build Presence Church. You can take that away right now. But so that the people of God are activated to do the work of ministry. That's what I want to awaken on the inside of you tonight, that you are a part of a movement of people. We're not just a community gathering that meet in this beautiful building. I don't believe this is the last building we're going to have. But I do believe that God wants to send you out. You are the church and the church advances and the gates of hell shall not prevail. prevail. So we're an advancing missionary organization. And so the strategy for that then, well look, just go back up there for us. The strategy of that will then be is what we're looking at doing is we're going to establish three worship teams. Those three worship teams are going to be established teams that work together and grow together as a team. And they are going to rotate across the two sites. So what that will mean is, is that um, the site over there and the site here will be getting the same connection, the same experience of worship, the same expertise, the same anointing. Uh, and it means that actually it creates this fluid connection as one body where it isn't, oh, that's that group over there and this is this group, but they stay connected to the bigger picture. And so with three teams, uh, each will serve at two sites, then they're going to have a week's rest. And then they'll serve at this site, then the next site, then they'll have a week's rest. And we start to rotate. Now, what will eventually happen is, is that we will see an established worship team raise up in that location where they then can then produce a second and a third team so that when they plant out from there, they can do exactly the same, that they start to serve the different sites. The same will happen with the leadership. So with the leadership, we have a core group of leadership. We do want to establish an apostolic leadership over Presence Church where you have the voice uh, that's apostolic and prophetic, the evangelist voice, the pastoral wisdom, as well as the teaching wisdom, that then actually pour into the two different sites. So there's going to be this connection of a core team that is rotating around, connecting into the bigger picture, that we're not just one location, but we're part of a movement that eventually will be three churches, four churches, and then maybe then into other cities and maybe other nations. I believe God has something much bigger than we we actually expect and so the strategy of that will be is that we see that move around this fluid teams that are moving where what is happening here happens in exactly the same as the other sites and the other site will though have um, a campus connector for now as we're raising people to be campus pastors who will uh, have a voice into the house they'll also minister the word into the house but these campus connectors will be those who connect people into the vision, connect people into the culture. They will be the ones who will be connecting with them pastorally, ensuring that they have access to all of the bigger stuff that we have going on with the training, the equipping, the life groups, etc. So it really isn't that we're planting another church, we're just planting another well that has the same water flowing through it. And so this is going to be a really fluid thing. And what some people may be tempted to do is... For example, Jeff is going and everyone it might be that you really like Jeff and you just follow where Jeff goes. You know, oh, Jeff is speaking at that you know, site B this week and so I'm going to go there. What we're asking for people to do is, is to listen out to the Lord and where he wants you to be planted because that's where you're going to properly grow. Because as the speakers and the ministry rotates, you're going to get a full expression of what God desires to get into the house, not just following an expression through the house. And so... Um, if you are part of that 30 to 50 people who desire to go and be a part of that mission out into another part of the city, then that would be your primary location. Now, what we will then do is, is every three months we will pull both locations together and we will just have an apostolic prophetic download of what God is doing in this season, uh, what he is doing in the 
in the city and the nation so that we all become on the same page. We have this one uh, sort of blended worship expression and we get to see that we're a part of something much bigger than our own sight and our own gifting. And then we then are able to then go and express that in the, the campuses that we're a part of. That's going to really take shape when you start to have four or five different campuses around the city. We actually believe we're going to have a presence church in each of the six towns in Stoke-on-Trent. That's what I believe is going to happen, and I believe it's going to happen in the next four years. And I believe that once we have that, there's a covering in the city where people are only ever three, four, five miles away from drinking from a well of revival where they can be equipped, trained, and released into kingdom mission. And so, where this comes for you, I really want you to capture the heart tonight that we are a going and ascending people. I really believe that the gospel is a going message. That we haven't just been brought in just to anchor ourselves to the floor. I saw a prophetic picture of people unhooking chains from the foundation and being able to be carried by the Holy Spirit to go into new ventures. That's what I see happening. And so the language over the next few weeks and months will be very much the language of hearing the go of the gospel. Carrying what we have here that is so precious, it's been fruitful but taking this and taking it into another part of the city. And I believe that the Lord is asking us to sow Presence Church as a seed into another part. And so sending those 30 to 50 people is an intentional act to create space for harvest because we will not grow anymore if we stay how we are. We're going to cap, we're going to be stifled, we're not going to be able to release. The only way we can actually see increase come with what God desires to do is if we go. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to getting back on that pioneer in front of breaking new ground. I can't tell you how excited I am. I love all of this, but there is nothing quite like going into a new area and seeing God establish something fresh. And I have an appetite for it again. And so we're going to go for it. You know, because the bold, you know, the righteous are bold as lions. And so I really want you to think about going. If you look at the graphic behind you, you see that you've got the central dots and they're springing to another dot. It's a prophetic picture of how connected we are, that what is in one house is equally flowing in another house. And I do believe that actually uh, we should be having not one weaker house than another. That's why we're going to send our best. We're going to send the best worship teams. We're going to send the best ministry, the best equipment, so that that house can truly get established and planted in that area. So then it's able to then host in its own right as well. And so we're going to go dig. And so as you go, I believe you're going to grow. I really do. I believe it creates space for you to step into ministry. Um, we'll train up uh, ministry teams to go lay hands on the sick, to step into the prophetic, to step into healing, uh, uh, to grow in our heart of service. So there's going to be coffee shops there. There's going to be pastoral needs. There's going to be um, welcoming and all of that type of need of welcoming people in and serving teams. And I do believe that your gifting will increasingly become more frustrated if we stay in this silo. But if we break out, we're going to suddenly start to see people flourish. And here's the thing. When you say yes to go, suddenly vision starts unfolding in front of you. Strategy starts to come. Suddenly you start getting ideas that you've never thought of and you wonder why. And it's just because you said yes to go. That's all it is. So I am not a pastor who wants to have a church where there's a thousand of us sat in every single week. I am not interested in that at all. Give me six churches with 150 people each, where all 150 of those are flourishing in their gifts, thriving in their calls upon their life, and then we'll actually have a church that's flourishing that the scriptures tell us about. And so as you go, you will grow, but also I'm asking you to sow your life. Not much, but I want you to sow yourself. I want you to sow if potentially you're feeling that awakening and you feel connected to here, that actually in the sacrifice of going into something that's not established and something new, you know, a seed has to die in order for it to be able to produce fruit. I want you to sow your gift into a city. I want you to sow your talents, your experience, your history with God, the anointing that he's got for you. I want you to sow your time. I want you to sow your finances in what God is doing. I do not understand 
a mentality in the church where they keep everything they have and they won't invest in eternal matters. I don't get it. You know, and generally we are a house who believe in giving God the first fruit every single month. It is seed in our hand. And if you see this as fruitful soil, I would encourage you, if you're not already giving your first fruit, your tithe to the Lord, you need to be praying about why or if that's something that you should be doing. Okay, and as you do that, and respond to the Lord in faithfulness. Go and look at his word. What does the word say about a generous people sowing? Because you cannot read the book of Acts, and you can't even read Jesus' ministry, separating the work of the kingdom from what we do with our wallets. And people don't like it because they're bad examples, but this is what he says. We can't trust ourselves with the natural resources that he's given us. How can he ever entrust us with the kingdom ones? And so we're going to sow everything that we've got. You know, for some of you, it may be that you're intentionally setting up a, a seed that's sown every single month faithfully. It might be that it goes to one side or the other. It really doesn't matter. But if you believe that you've been called to this house, you're telling me you've been called to be a missionary people, and missionary people sow everything that they've got. And so I really want to encourage you in that area. But it isn't just money. We know that. But it's the, also the sowing of who you are, your time, giving it to people, you know, the gifting. You know, we have people coming around our house for prayer ministry. Let me tell you, we're tired. We've had full-time jobs. I've got one more day, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, Presence Church hasn't grown because of me and Lauren, but there is something in when you create spice space so in your life, God is able to do abundantly more. It really is. And um, I would say to you, if you are sitting on a vision and a dream, he is waiting for you just to sow yourself. That, that is it. He's asking you just to say yes and really mean your yes, where actually you prioritize eternal matters over natural matters. You know, and uh, for me, that was the biggest shift in my mindset that my time doesn't belong to me anymore. My house doesn't belong to me anymore. My resources don't belong to me. My gifting doesn't belong to me, but I have given myself wholly to Christ that his name and his fame will be known and grown. And I believe the Lord wants to do that with a whole community of people where we start seeing dead people walking in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And I believe the more we sow, the more his life is able to come up. That we die to ourselves, our own passions, our own ways of living, so that the kingdom of God truly can be the first thing. What does it seek first? The kingdom of God. And all of his righteousness. And so we're going to be a sowing people. And tonight really is about that. It's about awakening you and reconnecting you into what Presence Church really is all about. We're a missionary movement that is being called to baptise the whole city. I believe that we're going to need public baptism pools where we've got hundreds of people that we're baptising in public. Uh, you know, multiple people in this room have seen us have revival tents in parks in the city where we're preaching the gospel and there's healing breaking out. People get free haircuts and beauty things that are going on. But blessing the city, but with the power of the gospel where we actually start to believe we are who he says that we are. And we can only do that when we actually get to go. And so this is just but the first step. And if I'm being completely honest with you, it is still overwhelming every time we try and do something new. You know, even what God did on Sunday, you know, just that first taste of that new season, that increased anointing that God's put on the house, it overwhelmed me. And it may look like we know what we're doing, but trust us, we're just people who are saying yes like you are. And so if you're new, if you've been with us from the very beginning, I really want to encourage you. I want you to pray about what God is doing with you. You know, why are you here? You know, is it a reaction from another church or is it a revelation that God's called you for such a time as this? And it's either one of the two. It's a reaction or a revelation. And so if you have the revelation that God is doing something new in this house, he has actually brought you into this house not to stay but to be sent out, cast out, that ekbalo violent word to send you out into the harvest. And so I ain't going to keep you. I want you to go. <laughs> is that okay? Has anybody got any rejection issues that need healing? <laughs> Can we pray? Is that okay? Can we sow this to the Lord in prayer right now? Does this sound like it's God? Does this sound like it's kingdom? Does this sound like it's the book of Acts so we don't hold on to what we've got but we give everything back over to the Lord? If we do this, I promise you, the city ain't going to know what's hit it. 
not by our power, not by our strength, but by his spirit, says God. Let's just stand and pray.